thanks very much. Okay, um, I have to go through these slides quickly. Um, luckily, I covered a couple of them earlier today. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of a flavor of what we do. And I was asked to talk about um, how horticulture, uh, how we incorporate nutrition outcomes into our programming and also what we're doing to think about scaling up some of the things we're working on. So um, we talked about this earlier, why horticulture, the fact that it's a high value crop, income generation, um, diet diversity, micronutrients, and also women's crops. Our program has been in the many parts of the world so far in the first four years of the program. So we have activities in uh, Central America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and here in Asia. Um, what I'm going to do today, since I have limited time, is I'm going to focus on some of the technologies we've been working on in the area of post-harvest, because that's an area that for fruits and vegetables is really, really important. And uh, I actually had this slide, I had these slides before we had our conversation earlier, but in any case, so post-harvest. Um, and post-harvest handling, of course, is a key technology for horticulture um, because um, losses can be very, very high. They can be as high as 80% for leafy greens, for example. Um, we also need to maintain the quality and the safety of these products uh, to be able to market them and also to have good nutritional outcomes. So um, as an example, if you look at India, um, studies show that um, while India is the third largest producer of fruits and vegetables, their um, per capita consumption is actually very small as well as their exports. And the losses can be, well on average they're 50% and of course they can be higher for some crops. Um, and actually the value of the losses is actually equal to the value of their automobile industry, just to give you a sense of perspective there. Um, and of course, because of these high losses, the margins are really small and prices tend to be high, which probably leads to low consumption and, and some of the, um, the inability of horticulture to play a key role in nutrition in India. So India horticulture, as in many places in the world, needs better post-harvest. So when we look at post-harvest losses, the factors that are most important when you're talking about perishable commodities, number one is temperature. And of course, cold chain and cooling are often lacking in many places around the world. Water loss is the other one, and that's directly related to temperature, um, but also related to relative humidity. And then we have physical damage, which tends to be a very, very excessive due to poor handling. And then of course, diseases are a major issue. There are other issues too, but I'll leave it at those top four. So for example, here with these broccoli, these were held for seven days at different temperatures. It's a little hard to see in the slide, but at high temperatures, you get yellowing, um, decay, and deterioration in quality. Also, excessive water loss. Actually, the, the broccoli on the bottom, if you held them like this, you could probably wave them around like a flag because they're so limp. So some of the technologies we've been looking at, one is, um, uh, cooling. So we're trying to figure out what are the ways that we can introduce cooling for cold storage and potentially even for, for transportation uh, in an inexpensive way that makes it achievable for um, smallholder or resource poor farmers. So um, you're probably familiar with charcoal um, uh, charcoal storage units, where here they use a charcoal in a mesh on the walls of the structure and then they drip water on that and the water evaporates and it cools the air. And uh, it's hard to see in this slide, but this is a similar concept with uh, made out of brick with sand in between and you get the sand wet, it evaporates and cools the inside of that uh, container. It's called a zero energy cooler. The problem with these is that we really believe they don't work so well in really humid environments. They really can only cool about 10 degrees Celsius and that's really not enough. Um, but in dry climates, they can work reasonably well. They're certainly better than nothing. We've also been uh, testing this device called the CoolBot. It's actually manufactured by a company in the US called Store It Cool. And it's a, um, a special controller that connects to a window air conditioner unit and it allows the air conditioner to cool down to um, storage temperatures, two degrees Celsius, for example it's easily achievable. And then we combine that together with inexpensively built um, rooms out of local materials that have good insulative properties. And we um, have been doing studies showing how we can extend the life of 
fruits and vegetables in these facilities. We're involved in a project in Bangladesh that's going on at the moment uh, in collaboration with SIP um, and ABRDC. And we're looking, um, with SIP we're looking at potatoes. So this just shows how potatoes are harvested and stored in um, these sacks. Um, when they put them in the ambient storages, they have issues with um, sprouting, but also bacterial rot. And so we're comparing three different storage facilities. This CoolBot unit I mentioned, the typical, just an ambient storage, and then this improved ambient, which has a false floor with um, water underneath that does evaporate some. Um, so we're, we're checking temperatures, checking relative humidities, and checking the quality of the potatoes when they come out of the storage facility. We also, with the CoolBot, are trying to uh, develop um, the technology to use that with solar power. We have done that successfully. Um, solar power does add a lot to the cost, but in, in some locations, that's your only option with that technology. We're also looking at drying of horticultural crops. Uh, so solar drying um, is an option. If you can dry the product, you can hold it. If, uh, if you're able to hold it under dry conditions, you can keep it during the off season when there's no production. Um, this is your typical cabinet dryer that's used to dry a lot of products. It doesn't work so well in cloudy weather and it can, can take a while to dry product. Um, our lab has been looking at this modified design we call the chimney dryer where the product is placed um, in trays along here and then the hot air or the air comes through here and then up the chimney. We find we get much higher temperatures, greater airflow, and much faster rates of drying with this new technology. And we're actually starting to, um, well, our, our PIs are starting to look at it for grain drying as well. I mentioned earlier the drying beads that we're looking at for seed drying, but we're also interested in these for post-harvest because they can be used to store any dried product. So they can do the final drying and then keep the product dry. Uh, while it's being stored in an airtight container. We've also looked at them for uh, drying of vegetables and fruit. It actually works quite well. So in areas where it's rainy or cloudy, you could still effectively and quickly dry these products. So how do we think about or how do we attempt to scale up some of the technologies that our researchers have been looking at? Um, our scaling strategy is, at this point is threefold. And it's an evolving strategy. I've learned a lot at this meeting, so we'll be thinking about how to modify it. But we have three regional centers of innovation um, that I'll talk about. They play a role. We uh, work on private sector partnerships and entrepreneurship. And then, of course, extension and, and market linkages are another aspect. So in terms of the centers of innovation, we have three. One in uh, Honduras, in Zamorano University one at Cassettesart University in Thailand, and that would be the one that would service Nepal here, one um, in Kenya at uh, Kari Bika. And these centers are places where we uh, test and adapt the technologies we've been working on. We have local people um, work with the technologies, try to adapt them further to local conditions, and then we have demonstrations to bring in entrepreneurs who hopefully will be enticed to take up these technologies. Now, I, as I said, I've learned a lot yesterday about that and have some new ideas about what we might do to further encourage that uptake. We have worked a lot with private sector partners in our program. A lot of our projects are in collaboration with companies. We have one uh, with insect control nets, agri-nets. Uh, the drying bead is Rhino Research. We have some, product, some projects where we're linking growers to markets with Sun International Hotels in Zambia. The Store at Cool, that's a cold storage project, that's another company. And then in Ghana, we're working with bakers to incorporate sweet potato flour. I really believe that the key to adoption of these improved technologies is a linkage to the market. Um, far farmers need to know that they're gonna get a return on their investment, otherwise they're not gonna spend the resources on improving their practices. I think whether it's an improved practice or a, a physical technology, they have to know that they're gonna be able to get a higher price or be able to sell that product. Okay, 
Uh, in terms of market linkages, we've been doing some work with participatory market chain approach, trying to bring together different value chain actors to um, stimulate market linkages between growers and uh, buyers. And in Cambodia, we're working with savings groups to um, see if we can uh, convince them to use their savings to invest in improved uh, post-harvest and, and production practices for horticultural crops. I think I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. So in terms of nutrition and our nutritional um, outcomes, um, I mean, there's a lot of information out there that talks about crop diversity and how crop diversity can um, lead to a better diet. Um, and there are studies like this one here that was published in 2010 that talks about, you know, the more food groups someone eats, the better the probability of an adequate diet. And so, of course, adding horticulture to your uh, staple crops is one way to diversify the diet. And this was an interesting study by Miller et al. where they, they started off with just a, a white rice diet and they looked at the nutrition um, in the diet. And then they started adding in foods. And so they added lentils and then they added tomato and then carrots and mango. And so as you add more and more crops, you can see that the, the, the number of nutrients the important nutrients that people need to have um, are more and more of them are reaching the adequate level. But what are the pathways to um, nutritional adequacy um, through horticultural production? If we grow more horticultural crops, are people necessarily going to eat them? And the discussion earlier really highlighted some of those challenges. And it's something that uh, we want to look at more closely. Certainly when, you, uh, when women grow horticultural crops, they do have more income. They may be able to use that income to provide better diets for their families. So um, we want to try to work together with the Nutrition Innovation Lab and other groups to develop this information about um, you know, the linkages between production and consumption. If we grow more, you know, will they increase their consumption? So presumably someone's going to increase their consumption because the product's in the market. But is it the local community? Is it the household? Or is it some distant uh, location where people are going to eat more? Uh, and if the farmer doesn't eat the product, why not? What are, what are the barriers? Is it lack of information? Is it a desire to sell the product? Again, we discussed that before lunch. I think I'm gonna, and then the final point I wanted to make, we're interested in getting more information about consumption of fruits and vegetables. It seems like there really isn't a lot of good information out there. The information we found through FAO seemed to be focused, they were sort of making this link that if it, based on production and market levels of fruits and vegetables, that naturally led to, that was the amount that was consumed. We'd like to maybe do some more specific work trying to further understand how much people really are eating. Okay, so with that, I think Jeff is telling me time out. I've gone over my time, so I'll go to the last slide. Thank you very much. To learn more about scaling and how you can contribute to this growing body of knowledge, please visit agrilinks.org slash scaling.